Today we're going to drive a World War II Jeep in modern Southern California traffic. Oh, Case. We've got this, Tommy. We're off to Los Angeles. <laughs> We're being passed. This Jeep, um, aka Dreamboat, uh, came off the line in April of 1945 and it was sent immediately to Michigan, to an Army Air Force base in Michigan. I like your Jeep. <laughs> 45. So 45. Yours is probably faster. <laughs> Just barely. Yeah. I think there. Oh, there is a drive through. Oh, hey. There is a drive through at the in and out. Beautiful. Case, what did we just buy? We just bought a 1945 MB. This is really the original Jeep. And you've got to be excited because I know you're a huge Jeep guy, but you've never driven one of these 40s Jeeps. Case, I am over the moon. This is the icon, the legend. It was designed for battlefields around the world. And today we are in Southern California, going to take it onto the mean streets where Starbucks rules. <laughs> yeah, we're going to take one of the most iconic American vehicles in history, which is not iconic, by the way, for its top speed. And we're going to drive it on some of the craziest highways that I think exist in this country. So Case, let's talk about what makes this Jeep special. So first of all, it is tiny. Yeah, it weighs about 2,400 pounds. These vehicles, it's hard to get a feel for actually how small they are until you're standing next to them. By modern day standards, this is about the size of a side-by-side. -side. Yeah, and it's got all the original military stuff. So we've got the old school wheel and tire package. We've got no doors. Let's talk you through the safety features. <laughs> um, this is to prevent you from falling out. Yeah. And that's all you got. Call that kind of a seat belt of sorts because you don't have one for the seat itself. Yeah, your fuel tank right under you there. Really, when you're driving around in this, feels more like you're sitting on top of it than necessarily sitting inside of it. Yeah, for sure. And then out back case, we got our jerry can. So if yep. we're ended, we'll at least explode. And then <laughs> beyond that, these little bumpers that'll do nothing. This Jeep is one of the coolest pieces of history I've ever laid my hands on, and I can't believe we're about to drive it. Yeah, and all of this is powered by the epic Go Devil 134 cubic inch inline four cylinder side valve engine. It's simple as can be, but it's actually a pretty rev happy little motor. It's a three speed manual. These are so much fun to drive. All right, okay, so for safety, I have brought along my Amazon army helmet. Yeah, I've just got eye protection, I guess. That's about it. I think this has made me less safe. Yeah, is your chin strap supposed to be like that? It looks goofy as hell. It's uh, oh. That's not the chin strap, what are you doing? <laughs> I, I, I don't know, that's the chin strap. Is it? Well then what's this? This is broken is what this is. I think you bought a defective unit. You don't think this is military approved? No. I think we're ready to roll. <laughs> All right, so let's see how we start this World War II Jeep. So there's a key here. Yeah. It, nothing. Yeah, so you don't turn the key. It's uh, interesting, actually, and this was common on eh, quite a few older vehicles, especially military vehicles. Start it. There oh, you go. Okay, so what you're saying, it's got push button start. Push button start. Wow. So a slightly different push button than what we're used to these days. Okay, so three speed manual. So. First gear is not where it should be. So in a normal car, first gear is here. Yeah. But that's actually reverse. Yeah, exactly. So down and toward you is first. First gear. So where second supposed to be is first. Where first is supposed to be, you're it's backing reverse. into the car behind you. Exactly. Yeah. All right, turn signals? Nope. Okay. No turn signals. Power steering? Nope. Uh, do you uh, you want to put your safety strap on? Are you? Oh, my safety strap is on, Tommy. What about seat belts? Nope. That's okay, at least we have four airbags. You got one mirror too. <laughs> but the visibility is fantastic. If, We're outside, if, outdoors. If you need parking sensors in a World War II Jeep. There's something wrong. Something's gone terribly wrong. Well, whatever you back into, you're not gonna take any damage because this is all steel. We have an excellent horn though, are you ready? <laughs> yeah. Great horn. <laughs> all right, so first drive, 15 miles an hour feels like, what do you think, Case? This doesn't feel so bad. It's really when you start to get up to 30, 40 miles per hour that things feel like 
you're doing something that this doesn't want to do. What's really funny is that, for example, this plaque here on the glove box says that you should be able to do 60 miles per hour in third gear. I can promise you it won't. You're skeptical? I'm very skeptical because I grew up driving a CJ2, spent a lot of time in a 1940s Jeep, and ours runs well, it's not going to hit 50. Well, we're going to see what it does here in a sec. <laughs> it takes a little while to get used to. The transmission is like stirring soup. You kind of got to figure out where the gear goes, and once you figure it out, it goes in quite nicely. Yeah, and they are big, long throws to the shifter. What's interesting is that these military Jeeps mechanically actually had quite a few differences to the civilian Jeep. And the same thing with the tub, this entire vehicle, there's a lot of differences between it and even the CJ2 that was heavily based on it. Should we signal left here at the red light? Left, that's where we're going. We can just tell people verbally. We're going left. We're going left. <laughs> Would you describe this as a comfortable vehicle case? Right now, I, I don't really think it's that bad, actually. It's more when you get going at speed, and especially when you roll over some bumps, that it starts to be not so comfortable. So what you're saying is at zero miles an hour, it's pretty comfortable. Yeah, if you're not moving, it's just like sitting in a church pew. Slightly padded, though, so maybe even better. All right, onto a real road with real cars. <laughs> what do you think, straight out of the five? <laughs> Uh, if we're brave, we're doing it. Are we actually? We are. <laughs> All right. Oh, I like it, Tommy. On to one of wow. the. That is that is a real highway. On to one of the most notorious highways in the world <laughs> in an 80-year-old World War II Jeep. This is a harebrained scheme, I think, is what they would have called this back when this this vehicle was new. Well, look, Case. This is a vehicle that was designed to be shot at in Japan. Yeah. Germany. Well, and, and where we are right now, there's probably only a 50-50 shot that we're going to get shot at. So we're safer <laughs> now than most of the people that drove these at the time. I think our biggest threat is a girl in a uh, Nissan Altima texting. <laughs> now, Case, there's a guy behind us in a JL, brand yeah. new angler. <laughs> Pretty cool. He probably thinks we're so cool. He probably thinks we're so stupid. Until, yeah, well, he probably thinks we're cool until he gets stuck behind us when we merge onto the highway here. There hey, we go. Oh, there we go. Onto the on-ramp. There's the five north. Watch out, Tacoma. <laughs> we are really doing this case. There's some true Americans coming through. Yeah, we really are. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> this is so scary. <laughs> Whose idea was this, by the way? This is the worst idea we collectively have ever had. I was not part of the brainstorming session. Here, how are your brakes? Uh, there. Seems like that pedal really goes quite a ways before we actually stop. All right, race in the Tacoma. We're losing. Already lost. In the second, that's 12 miles an hour. Woo! In the third, that's 20. The fun thing about this motor is that it really likes to rev. Oh, Case. We've got this, Tommy. <laughs> We're off to Los Angeles. <laughs> you can literally reach out and touch the car next to you. Oh, yeah. Well, it's a good thing that we're narrow because the steering is not very good. No. So we can stay in the lane. There's about 30 inches of play in the steering wheel. <laughs> We're being passed. That's 40. I'm flat out, Case. This is it? Is that full throttle? 42. So says that. 43. <laughs> this doesn't feel quite right. I kind of, I wish there was more traffic. Oh my god, the steering is so bad! <laughs> it's like driving in a 1920s movie! <laughs> Look at this! Yeah. Why are you doing the steer? There's so much movement in the wheel. Okay, I've had enough of this. I think we should... Hey, we it. got a thumbs up! Woo! <laughs> Thank you. That guy's letting us in. It smells warm. <laughs> Oh my god, my heart is beating so fast right now. <laughs> that was 46 miles an hour. 
pretty impressive. Here comes a bump. Oh, that's not bad. Case, here's the thing. It's got more to give. I don't know if I have more to give, though. <laughs> well, yeah, it doesn't steer well, so that doesn't help our situation. This highway's got what? Ten lanes? Yeah. Yeah, this this is a this highway is the real deal. I don't know what the safety rating is of the Jeep, but it's probably not too good. <laughs> We're gonna be my blind spot monitoring, okay? If I'm not uh, yeah, you're good. Just green bloody murder. Yeah. This feels like not what this vehicle is intended to do. Believe it or not, though, it is running beautifully. Yeah, it is. The it, it drives well. This is obviously a very well looked after Jeep. Yeah, it's not overheating. <laughs> okay, right lane, 45 miles an hour. This is where we're meant to be. This is a good spot. I don't know where this exit goes. I really don't care, and we're just gonna. This is gonna be our exit, I think. Yeah, I think back roads from this point on. We did it! <laughs> Alright, where do we think next? Maybe? Um, I have no idea where we are. I think you've spent more time in California than I. Maybe, do, we, yeah. do we have navigation? Yeah, you want to... Yeah, yeah, I'll queue up that car plate. Queue it into the nat sat -nav. Maybe we can find, like, a, a jungle? But yeah. Or a local landing craft you can possibly use? Yeah, maybe we could drive underwater? Okay, so with that done, we can talk a little bit more about what this Jeep is really like to drive on more realistic speeds. Yeah. Okay, so, first of all, I don't think first gear is synchronized. Doesn't no, sound like it. It's a little crunchy. Yeah, and I wonder if that is a difference between this Jeep and the civilian Jeep, because the Jeep I grew up with was not so difficult. Once you get into the second and third, it's pretty easy. So let's talk a little bit about the history of this vehicle case, because it's really interesting. So by the late 1930s, early 1940s, the U.S. government realized things were not so hot in the world. Yep. So there was a global war going on, and they also realized we need a standardized, small, lightweight, go-anywhere vehicle, which is something they didn't have. So they put out a request for bid to 135 manufacturers. Yeah. This was in the early 1940s. And of those 135, only one produced a prototype in time. And as most people know, or most Jeep people at, the, at least, that company was Bantam. Yeah, the American Bantam Car Company, <laughs> which was this little tiny company based in Butler, Pennsylvania. And get this case. Bantam designed the basis of the iconic Jeep in under 50 days. Yeah, and is they, it 49? 49 days! <laughs> and they drove it to the camp where the government put it through its paces. Yeah, and they it was a star. With the basic Jeep design in 49 days, which is just amazing. Now, ultimately, Case, Bantam was a little teeny tiny car company, better known for making these little shoebox cars yeah. than, than for making a huge amount of military vehicles. Yeah, they really didn't have the means to manufacture this vehicle, which is why both Willis and Ford took over that side of things and actually manufactured these. Yeah, so basically the U.S. government took the Bantam design, they gave it to Willis, Willys, and Ford and said, Go make it better. Yep. They did, and then the standardized Jeep that we're driving today was born. And this is called a what case? Well, this is the MB. Yeah. And the reason I'm, I'm making you say the word is because there is some disagreement in whether or not oh. you pronounce it Willis or Willies. Yeah, see, I've heard people say it both ways. I think at this point, if you say it one way, stick with that. I was raised to say Willis. Yeah, I mean, and the company was named after a guy named Willis, right? Yep. But then promotional material eventually switched over to Willies, and the Jeep people now call it Willies. So you can kind of go back and forth on how you how you want to pronounce the name. But I like Willies because that's what people know today. Um, and MB just stood for military version B. And what was the Ford one called? 
That was the GPW. Yeah, GPW and the W. And nice GPW. Jeep. I like your TJ. <laughs> I like your Jeep. <laughs> 45. So 45. Yeah. <laughs> Yours is probably faster. Just barely. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Do you have an airbag? Do you have, do you have air conditioning? <laughs> wow. Cruise control? Military Same. history? There you go. There we go. No yeah. military history. Oh, that's we got one on them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're probably quicker. USAA, does that count? USAA, <laughs> there yeah, you that go. does count as military history. Exactly. Have a good one. <laughs> yeah, so the Ford was a GPW. Yep. And the Willis was this MB. And these were produced up until 1945, at which point it was replaced later on by the M38, right? Yep, that's right. But ultimately, post-war, they started producing this basic design in a version called the CJ, which stands for... Civilian Jeep. There you go. It's crazy. Yeah. So we're now driving deep into the heart of Southern California traffic. Yeah. Um, what's amazing is this is a difficult place to drive because people are in a huge rush to get everywhere. Yep. If you Not drive us. a military car from the 40s, however, people seem to kind of give you some space. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I, I think we were holding up a couple people and they probably weren't as stoked as maybe those Jeep folk, but it's not so bad. We haven't gotten honked at. Yeah, we're the ones doing the honking. We were, we were. Oh, oh God, the horn got stuck. <laughs> <laughs> at least it's not as loud as the T. <laughs> the previous owner did tell me the horn does get a little stuck. So yeah. Maybe we'll be careful with the that horn. Was, that was the truth. <laughs> <laughs> no, people are so excited to see this this, this vehicle. Yeah, man. Um, because you just can't be mad at this vehicle. No, it's it's cool, and this is an absolute icon. People still obviously love Jeeps today. There's one right there that's got a slotted grill, and this is where it all started. So who wouldn't be excited to see this piece of history? Yeah, it's really cool driving around and, and seeing people's reactions. Um, and I, I think what makes this vehicle really stand out in people's minds is that this is the symbol of Allied victory yeah. in World War II. I think more than any other vehicle during that war, but really any vehicle in, in conflict sense, because I mean, not to get too history based here, but in my opinion, World War II was one of the last times in, in world history where there was almost a definitive divide between good and evil. You yeah. know, and, and wars since then have been very complicated. And not that World War II wasn't, but the, the line is blurred on, on is U.S. involvement the correct thing to do? Yeah. And I think if you ask most people, the atrocity happening not only, you know, in Europe, but also Asia, people would say, yeah, the U.S. was on the right side of that war. And this is the vehicle that really symbolizes American victory. Yeah, it really does. Every part of it. You walk up to it and that's the feeling that you get immediately when you set your eyes on it. And it is such a cool machine. And these vehicles are amazingly simple, lightweight, rugged. There's almost nowhere that they can't go or haven't gone. And they're still around today. That's a testament to the way that these were built, to the way that things were built just back in this time period. This is an absolute icon of this time period because of that. Yeah, right. Do you know where the word Jeep comes from? It's from the name GP, right? The abbreviation? Yeah, I mean, there's some debate. General like purpose if, vehicle? If you say GP fast, yeah. it sounds like Jeep. Right. Um, there was also a cartoon character back in the day, which was a character called the Jeep. I think it was Popeye? I don't really know for sure. Oh no, gotta find a gear. Yeah. We're not cartoon experts. No, we are not cartoon experts. But this little character had the ability to teleport everywhere. So it could go anywhere. Yeah, and show up everywhere. Hence GP, right? Jeep. Yeah, and there is definitely a debate about what side of things the name Jeep came from. But either way, yeah, it became iconic and it all started here. Yeah, for sure. Now, Case, you've driven a lot of these 40s as well. You've driven your 40s Jeep. I've driven one 40s Jeep a lot, hundreds of hours. 
my takeaway, having never driven one, is it's a really simple machine to drive. It is. Yeah, it's very easy to drive. This is how I learned to drive manual, and I think this is an ideal vehicle to learn how to drive manual on because it's so simple and easy to drive, so lightweight, pretty torquey motor, and it's so much fun. What's amazing about these, and especially when you get them over dirt, is this is a spectacularly entertaining, fun machine to drive. It's a blast. For sure, right. I'm slowly starting to figure out how to double clutch it to stop the transmission from <laughs> grinding. But once you get the transmission figured out, it's a very simple machine. Yeah, and I think that this transmission seems to be a, a little more uh, difficult than at least the one on our CJ2A at home. Right. And it could be, I think it's a different unit, right? It is. This is, I'm trying to, I think the name of this transmission is T84 and the one in the CJ is a T90. I could be wrong about that name, but the civilian Jeep had a more beefed up, upgraded, evolved transmission. So it's, it's not the exact same trans as this. Right. Yeah. It's a little different. And like they changed some things from the military version to the civilian version. Like the tub is different. Yeah. The actual body's different, right? Yeah, because this has some indentions for your shovel and for your axe. This doesn't have the drains in the footwell that are just built in. Um, yeah, there's there's actually quite a few things that aren't just the grill. Obviously, the civilian Jeep said Willis on the side of the hood. It said it on the windshield. Also had a tailgate that said Willis. This doesn't have a tailgate at all. So there's a number of differences, uh, even in the dash. Yeah, right. And like the blackout lights. Yep. Your typical farmer in the 1950s is not probably be... didn't need blackout lights. Yeah. Wasn't worried about being bombed. Yeah, uh, this one having a glove box. Our CJ doesn't have that. It's also got these two map lights versus the one on our Jeep. So yeah, no, there's there's a number of differences. Almost just rear-ended a bus. That would have been pretty bad. <laughs> Thanks, oh look at this guy. He's letting me pass the bus. Appreciate it. Ooh. <laughs> This is almost um, almost more like riding a motorcycle than being in a car because we're very out in the open. You hear and see and feel everything going on around you. You want to navigate us to uh, in and out In and out Oh, sure. I feel like we have to. Oh, yeah. It's, it's behind, behind us. us. <laughs> Damn it. All right, we'll go right. We're going right. Here we go. Traffic. Merging with traffic, we got this. Not stressful at all. You know, Case, my biggest surprise is it's pretty fast. It does okay. The way that it's geared, it has no problem accelerating. It's just that the acceleration caps out, uh, you know, <laughs> at about 40. About We're going to go left in a little ways. Okay, so we'll great. have to make our way over. That is unfortunate news. Yeah. Oh God, we gotta go left. Please let us over, Kia. Oh, we got a little bit. It's not this one, it's the next. Woo! Ha <laughs> ha! We're good. Apparently, people were pretty impressed in the 40s over the speed. <laughs> yeah. Well, if all you had ever driven was something like the Model T, which I'm sure a lot of people's only experience with vehicles, if you were coming from a rural area, might have been the Model T. Yeah, so like from a, that to this, this is fantastic. This is a race car. Yeah. Just left. We got this. We get a left and we're going to make the light. On the plus side, we have very smooth roads where we are here in California, unlike Colorado. So we're actually doing okay comfort wise. Tommy's having to shift on the fly, but look at that. So much torque he could take off in look second. At that. By the way, Go Devil is the best name for an engine. Oh, it's the best. And it's such a good motor. It sounds pretty good for a four cylinder too. And Case, we got side pipes. Hell yeah, or side pipes. Side pipe. <laughs> Take that G-Wagon. Yeah, yeah, and it's a side valve engine. This is as simple as things get. I think it's an oil bath air filter too. I think you're right, yeah. The tires almost make more noise than the engine. <laughs> it is pretty quiet, actually, which is good for a stealthy military operation kind of ordeal. 
Yeah. Eventually, uh, we're gonna go right. Okay. Three minutes. Three. Uh, two minutes away now. Less than a mile away. I think we can make it. Okay. Full throttle. Evading the Germans. Yeah, I don't think these are the most harrowing circumstances one of these has been driven in, but for us, a couple of Zoomers that know nothing of the trials of war, this is uh, quite the experience. Yeah, This is, is the next right. Going to In-N-Out in a Jeep, can you imagine? I wonder how we're gonna make it through this harrowing experience. I don't know if I'm gonna make it to the crappy french fries is the bigger <laughs> problem, Case. Yeah. Absolutely terrible. No, I mean, I, this, this, genuinely, this whole experience has given me so much respect for our, our, our um, you know, soldiers of the past that, that fought to keep our country free, because driving this now is a lot of fun. You know, driving it in Germany in the late 1940s, mid to late 1940s, I mean, that is just an unbelievable thought. Yeah. God, I can't find a gear. There we go. <laughs> There's a gear. That's the oh. wrong gear. It's the wrong gear. Is that oh. third? Yeah, that was third. <laughs> We're being up, passed. Gave up one second. By asylum. How messed up is that? The ride is really bad. Uh, yeah, we're experiencing some of the only bumps that exist in California, and uh, yeah, it's not it's not smooth. But what's impressive about this is it was rated for around 800 pounds of payload, which for a vehicle that weighs oh. 2,400 pounds total, that's pretty impressive. That is amazing. Oh! And I'm sure these regularly exceeded the payload that they were intended for. I think you're right. So at the bigger road up there is where our in and out is. Okay. How, how creative of us as YouTubers to take weird vehicles through drive-thrus. I don't think it's, ever, it's never been done before. Never been done before. Yeah. People are seeing something completely new. <laughs> Does In-N-Out have a drive-thru? Yeah. Better. They better. What are we going to do for a thumbnail if they don't? I know. Zoomers. Zoomers. I'm a little offended to be called a Zoomer case. Yeah, well, it's a bummer, but I'm not sure it's any better to be called a millennial. Yeah, but I've never... I've, I've never even played Fortnite. How can, how can uh, I be called a Zoomer? Me neither. That's okay. We don't get to choose these things, man. Steering is bad, but you it think? is very light. Is it? Yeah. Well, I shouldn't say well, it's, it's lighter bad. when you're moving. Like, if you define good steering as it'll steer the car, yeah, then it's, it's great. Great steering. Tell you what, you're never going to have a power steering pump go bad. That's true. Uh oh, this one may not have an have a have a drive through. Well, we're gonna find out. I think there. Oh, there is a drive through. There hey. is a drive through at the in and out. Beautiful. Caution, low clearance. Oh, do we do we need to drop the windshield? Is it worth the line? I don't know. How bad do you want a burger? Not that bad. Oh no. But uh. What are you doing? I'm just trying to get out of here. I'm trapped at the in and out Yeah, well, there's massive traffic at the in and out and uh, we're not sure it's worth it. It took a lot of bravery to go in a battlefield in this vehicle. Yeah, I would say so. This is... Uh, <laughs> This, this is not a protective thing. Uh, it's unbelievable. I was talking to the historian who sold this to us, Dylan, and like, sure, these were used as scout cars. They were used to haul people and things and everything around, but they yeah. were also used in areas where you were being shot at. Yeah, which is a terrifying thought. Shot at? I'm sitting under over 10 gallons of gas. <laughs> it's two oh inches my from God. my bump. Almost knocked out by an Axis power. Yeah, could you imagine getting taken out by Gosh. a Honda with smoke tail lights? Yeah, I'm sitting on 10 gallons of explosive gasoline. <laughs> We're going left in half a mile. We can do this. See that Land Rover up there? It's leading to the left. Yeah. The Brits should have stuck with the original design. Yeah. Rookie this, mistake. This is quality. Honestly, it is quality. The fact it that it's 80 years old 
and it still runs on the same fuel everyone else is driving on. It's still driving on the same roads everyone else is driving on. Yeah. I mean, I don't have a radio or Apple CarPlay. Is this going to take us back? No, we're good. Okay. Yeah, let's try to avoid the freeway. <laughs> There's a police officer. Hello? Yeah. We're good. There's no reason for us to get pulled over. The left, the, this yeah, one left here. Oh, yes. Stomping on those brakes. I do feel like if you had to stop quickly, it would stop pretty quickly. You can lock them up in, in our old Jeep. So as a lifelong Jeep guy, I'm sure that there's been a part of you that's thought about this vehicle for quite a long time. Since I was three. And you've met your hero now. Oh, it's way better than I expected. Yeah? You know, <laughs> I drive so many new cars. We both do that. We're both excited about and we drive them and we're like, eh, it's okay. This not only looks cooler than you expect, it drives better than I expected, it's faster than I was expected, it <laughs> handles better. I mean, it does everything better. Yeah, I'm sure, awesome. I'm sure your expectations for its on-road drivability weren't through the roof. But I'll tell you what, again, at some point, when we get this on the dirt road back home, outside of the ranch, and when we get this on the pit course, and you see what this does off-road, you're gonna be blown away by how good this vehicle is. Yeah, because driving in Southern California is a very fun thing to do. It's not it's exactly, yeah. yeah, it's not exactly a useful piece of consumer advice. No. But driving this where it was intended to be driven, now that is something I'm really looking forward to. Yeah, that's when this vehicle is really gonna shine. I'm glad you're enjoying driving this, this Jeep that is such a, a crucial part of the history of one of your favorite vehicles of all time but man i can't wait to get this back to colorado and for you to drive it where it really belongs i really think that jeep would benefit today from building something i mean obviously you're probably going to have to put a seatbelt in it but probably build a vehicle today that that has this dna i mean the new one still does it still has solid axles and manual transmission and you can get in two doors but i mean genuinely a small simple device yeah right that can be had for fifteen eighteen thousand dollars they would sell a bajillion of them there must just not be money in it because Otherwise, none of, the, none of the manufacturers want to build something simple, not even a modern version of what this is. I mean, this, the closest thing I think to this today is a side by side. Yes, you're exactly right. Yeah, but the side by side case, look, most of them are made out of plastic and have a CVT, yeah. right? This, this is a substantial vehicle, even though it's small and lightweight, it still is a very substantial vehicle that that feels well made. Yeah. Right? And to think that we built over 600,000 of these in four years. The design of this was come up with in less than 50 days. All those Cybertruck bros <laughs> that are like, Elon's the best. He built his futuristic, what, what would you call that thing? A, a doorstop. Yeah. It took them years. five years to get it into mass production. Yeah. It's still pretty minimal. And that hasn't won anything except the hearts of CrossFitters in Miami, <laughs> right? But this. This won the largest conflict in the 20th century. Well, and I think it was Eisenhower that said this is, was one of the three critical parts of being able to win that war. Right. 100%. No, I, I love this thing. I love what it represents. I think we're both incredibly grateful of the four founders that, that drove these vehicles to protect our country. Yeah. You know, that's who we're dedicating this video to. Um, the, the men and women that put their lives at risk and lost their lives for this vehicle. I mean, no YouTube video will ever repay that, but hopefully we're discovering something that, that you know, we're bringing this to a new generation of people that weren't around when this vehicle were new and couldn't experience what this thing was like. There's, there's a lot of amazing history here, and I'm glad that we're getting to be a part of it. All right, so that's our first look at what it's like to drive this Willys MB, but now we're gonna pass it over to Dylan. Dylan is the historian who's gonna bring to light the history behind this Jeep, and we're gonna find out a little bit more about it.
So let's start out with the story of this Jeep and how you ended up with it. So this Jeep, um, AKA Dream Boat, uh, came off the line in April of 1945 and it was sent immediately to Michigan, to an Army Air Force base in Michigan. And it uh, remained in Michigan up until the 1980s uh, with the Michigan National Guard. It was then sold as surplus uh, to a World War II veteran who wanted to restore it himself down in Georgia. Um, that veteran got it to a, uh, got it to a certain point and then passed away, and it was purchased by Ed Lapadura of Florida, who also restores Jeeps for D-Day memory tours. He restored the Jeep beautifully, and in 2021, I purchased it. The markings, as a historian and, and nerd, um, <laughs> I, I am a former city historian for City of Santa Ana. The markings are specific to Santa Ana Army Air Base, otherwise known as Western Flying Train Command Base Unit 1040. And this would have been the motor pool number. Were these unique to each Jeep? How did how did they signal? What did they mean? So the hood number is a type of serial number used by the Army as identification. The markings seen on the bumper are specific to the unit. Okay. Yes. And these Jeeps were used by every division within the military. Were yes. they all the same? Were they a little different depending on the? Uh, well, yes, they were used by every single branch in the military. Uh, Marines, they had a specific format that they wanted their Jeeps in, like color, a much darker green. The Navy had gray. And of course, this is customizable. So you would see um, ambulance Jeeps, like Holden Jeeps in the Pacific uh, with litter racks. Uh, you would see dash-mounted machine guns, pintle-mounted machine guns, um, now, the stars... Stars are for the U.S. Army. Okay, so stars are U.S. Army. Yeah. And the star on the hood, would that have been original to this Jeep? Um, if it had seen combat overseas, yes. So imagine you are a pilot, um, you know, a thousand feet off the ground up observing a battle for, say, field artillery. Yeah. Um, the star is easily visible from the air, and you are able to identify where the line of embarkation is. These hooks retain the hood down. Okay. So with those pop, now we can lift the hood. And there's your engine bay. Yep, and then that'll just rest up against the yes. windshield frame. Yes. Um, on the hood, there are those, um, those wooden bars with uh, cloth, and they're meant to protect the windshield, the okay. windscreen. So we'll fold this down for a sec. Yep. And let's kind of show what the other ones do, because I think this is a really cool part. So on the inside, there are two levers. You can pop these. Oop, there we go. And what was the purpose of this, Dylan? Why did they have a need to fold the windshield oh, down? Okay, so this makes it more aerodynamic. You want to bring your hook out? Yep. Uh, this makes it more aerodynamic for transportation. And um, at, at speed, uh, the windshield would bend or break. Oh, really? Yeah. I also yeah. imagine that this would be easier for shipping, right? Because you oh, could probably course. stack them. After World War II, you, you would see things like a Jeep in a crate, which would be a partially dismantled Jeep. It would be the tub with the engine, everything inside of it, and then the wheels taken out and arranged inside a crate. All right, so we'll put this back up, right. and then let's talk about some other, some other really cool and interesting features. Let's fold that up. It's amazing how easy this is. Okay. It's one of the things I just can't get over is the simplicity. This is a very close cousin to a Model A. In fact, um, you can still crank, you can start crank this thing if you wanted to. Yeah, and what would, what would the need of that be? So if you had a dead battery or yeah. your starter went out, you could, look at that, there's a little hole, stick a crank through there onto the, the front end of the crankshaft there and whoop, spin it over. That is so cool. And Dylan, explain to me the headlight and marker light situation because this is pretty different from a modern vehicle. So, if you're in a combat area and you believe to be, um, it's, let's say you are in England in the 8th Air Force, much like Master of the Air, and the Germans are flying above you, you don't want to be uh, seen at night driving. So, of course, if you're able to, without blackout rules, you're able to use your regular headlights, but there's also blackout and marker lights. There's your blackout. And there's your blackout light there, and here's your marker lights. So these would be would be used to illuminate a portion of the road, just enough for you to see where you're going, and for other vehicles coming towards you to note that you are in, uh, coming in the opposite direction towards them. Now let's pop the hood because um, there's some other really clever engineering. So that folds yes. back. Yep. One thing which is just fantastic is you've got great access to this little Go Devil engine, mm -hmm. and I imagine that was on purpose. Oh yeah. 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 So again. 
most military vehicles of World War II are designed to be easily worked on and, and, and fixed, basically plug and play, by guys in the motor pool. Um, parts were easily accessible. If this part went out, plug in another one. Da -da 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 -da. And, and so you have the ability to really reach in and work on things um, because time is lives. Yeah, and another really interesting feature I'm seeing here too is these headlights, you can undo these little wing nuts. Yeah, when I first got this thing, I actually worked on this at night and I remembered this trick. Okay, and we do this, there we go, and there you go. Look at that! So you can work on this at night uh, with these illuminated headlights. Absolutely yeah. genius! Yeah. What a great idea! And um, let's talk a little bit about this engine. So it's, um, it's just a little four-cylinder. Uh -huh. What was the top speed of these Jeeps? Oh, about 40. Yeah? Yeah. It gets, you know, for a four-banger, it gets a little shaky. Yeah, I bet. But uh, it, it, it goes. <laughs> yeah. It definitely goes. Now, um, were these designed, so for like, like the, the, the landing in Normandy, um, there was obviously a, a stretch of water that these had to cross. Were these designed to handle deep water? Were there things that, uh, that a private could do to prepare their Jeep for water? Um, there were amphibious Jeeps known as seeps okay. that looked like a boat and they would have a propeller in the back. Wow. Um, there were also Jeeps modified by the Marine Corps that, would, uh, that had snorkels. Okay. Um, they would cut a hole in the, um, in the hood and have an exhaust snorkel coming out. So you'd have a, the big tube off the carburetor. Yes. Essentially. Yes. All right, very cool. Now, one thing which is interesting I'm noticing on this side is we've got a shovel and an axe. Is that standard equipment? Though? Yeah, those are the pioneer tools. Those are meant to extricate yourself from a situation. So if you are, if you if you need to dig yourself out, you're, you're good. Um, or you need to get some dirt to make some traction. There you go. Um, or if, say, the, uh, the Germans uh, put logs across the road. Mm. You can chop it up yourself. Wow. Yeah. So you had to be a fully self-sufficient person in this Jeep to be successful on a, on a mission. Yeah, most of the greater, greatest generation were. Yeah. Because yeah. wow. they lived a very different life than what we do today. Yeah. I'm also noticing down here, the um, fire extinguisher. Yeah, that. so that fire extinguisher, it's, it is, uh, most of them were never used. Okay. Uh, because these Jeeps, they, the, so many of them were made and they could be easily replaced. Um, like the life expectancy of a Jeep in combat in Europe was, I believe, less than 120 days. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And then on the interior, this is an interesting feature. So um, flip this up, is there a little, just a cushion. Okay, so the cushion folds up. That's your fuel tank. And what kind of fuel were they using back in, in the 40s? Is it just typical gasoline? Yeah, typical gasoline, leaded. Leaded, yeah. yeah. Do you run lead additive yes, in this? I yeah. Do. Okay. It's great to know. And then this light switch. Now this is very foreign to me. So um, first of all, it doesn't turn when you first approach. You have to push in on this little lock. Yeah. Why did they have the lock there? Was that to prevent you from accidentally flipping it? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what do the different different things indicate? Okay, so on the extreme uh, right, mm -hmm. you have your headlight. Okay. Then you have your stoplight, which is rear. Yep. Then you have your uh, mark, your blackout light, your blackout marker light. Yep. And then your blackout light on the front. Wow. That's really cool. And I'm also noticing too, there's a little lever up here to black out the panel lights. Is that what that's for? Oh, that's what these are. Okay. So you yeah. can turn them on and off. Yes. So by pulling this knob, um, you'll send a little ray of light through this slot in this metal cover here to illuminate your dashboard instruments. Wow, unreal. And then the hand throttle as well. Yes. Okay, very cool. And then basic canvas seats here. Yes. Um, top storage underneath the passenger side, huh? Yes. Wow. Oh, look at yep. that. Yep. Wow. So that's where that lives. And what are these little bars on the rear? Uh, some believe that it is to put your feet so you can have, so you, when you're seated here, yeah. you are in a position to um, brace yourself in case you are uh, going at an incline or um, bumpy terrain. Comfortable rear seat? No, <laughs> not at all. Um, this is where you'd put the guy you didn't like. <laughs> And look, that's a really narrow rear seat. So I'd yeah. imagine that what, maybe three people could fit in a Jeep? No, you could you could pile in some dudes because could there's also seating. 
on the fenders, okay. on the tire, okay. uh, on the hood, on the front fenders. Uh, there's photos of 10 plus guys, you know, especially uh, in the 8th Air Force in England, just, you know, going to their plane, just piled into these things. So wherever you could put a body, yeah, that's a, that's yeah. a seat. Oh yeah, and there'd also be guys hanging off of this thing too. Wow. Yeah. Dude, that's unbelievable. What about those pads on the, is that so to cushion your thigh? Yeah, cushion your kidneys. <laughs> uh, because it has some suspension, but um, you will get jostled a little bit. Yeah. Unreal, and then storage cubbies? You have toolboxes. Oh, toolboxes. Yes. It's just a push-in? Yep, push-in. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Really cool, and a glove box. Yes. Got a lot of storage in it. Yeah. Wow. And it comes with a manual as well. Unbelievable. Yeah. And then out back, you've got jerry can here. Yeah. Spare tire, I recognize that. Are these just reflectors on the on either side? Yeah, those are just the reflectors. Okay. And then you got a pintle. Yep, and then you have your the stoplight right there. No, a That's lot it. of stop no. stoplight ability no. there. Nope, nope, not at all. So the US for their light general purpose vehicle, yep. we had the Jeep. Okay. Did other nations that we were fighting against, did they have their Jeep equivalents? Uh, the Germans had their Kubelwagen, mm -hmm. um, and also uh, uh, the Kubelwagen, which is actually still made today down in Mexico, you can get them um, licensed. The, the Japanese, they had a, a smaller version of a scout car, which you don't see many of those. Mm -hmm. uh, the British, they used ours, they used our stuff. and. Um, the Russians, they use whatever they could get, <laughs> okay. including Jeeps. <laughs> Interesting. So how did this compare to the Kubel? Was it was it pretty comparable? This is better. This is better? Not that I'm biased or anything. <laughs> Why was this better than a Kubel Oh, it could handle more, it could carry more. Um, it was much, it was more versatile, yeah. for sure. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And why do you think, I mean, of all of the military vehicles used in World War II, uh, not just the Jeep, but the Sherman tanks and the, the M37s, why why do you think the Jeep has become the symbol for American success in World War II? Ooh, it speaks to the industri industriousness of the nation. Okay. It speaks to the creativity of, of, of the nation, especially during a time of war. This Jeep could in many ways be a symbol of the culture of that generation hmm. because it is emblematic of making do with what's available and making it better. The, the, the Jeep is emblematic of what it is to be an American of that generation and to the point where the legacy continues to this day. Like there's a reason why Jeep continues with that grill design. Yeah. It's, it's, it's iconic, 100%. Dylan, thanks again, buddy. Oh, yeah. I mean, we really appreciate you selling us this Jeep and for allowing us to continue to tell its story, but we're not the historians and you are. And if folks want to find some really incredible pieces of history, where can they go? Uh, that would be the Vestiges of History YouTube channel where we tell of storied lives. Um, that is my baby. I'm, I'm new to YouTube. Um, I've seen some success uh, with it and I love my, my devoted fans and subscribers. Uh, it's... I want to give a voice to the voiceless and, and really give history, uh, people, the minor people in history, the voices that they deserve. And uh, this Jeep was part of that. Um, and I'm really, really happy that it's going to another YouTuber and to a great home where she gets to kiss the dirt. <laughs> and, um, and, and, you know, just keep the history alive. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Guys, thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you on the next episode. Comment below what else you want to see done.